us for another episode of Between Knits and Pearls. I'm your co-host, Emily, and you can find me at, coming from, to you from Alaska, by the way. And we're going to talk about the weather because it's been already a big topic today. But it's 55 degrees, so I get to wear a sweater. That's right. <laughs> and you can find me on the interwebs as Anders Mill Knits. Fantastic. Thanks, Emily. I'm Stephanie. I'm one of your other co-hosts for Between Knits and Pearls. I can be found on Ravelry and Instagram as Farmstead Knits. And I am coming to you today from the central state of Kentucky, where it is probably already 80 degrees. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we have a very special guest, one that I met, well, digitally, a couple months ago. And so we, to, joining us today is Heather. She is, I mean, I don't even know your official title over there at Knit Picks, Heather. So you introduce us. What's your okay. official title and everything? I'm the marketing manager for the yarn group at Crafts, at Crafts Group LLC, which is the parent company of Knit Picks and We Crochet. Um, and I do lots of marketing things. I don't even know. I don't know. I don't think anyone wants to go into my new details <laughs> of the marketing fun stuff that I get to do, but that's what I do. Well, you were just saying that you were doing some videos. Yet, uh, was that yesterday? Yeah. Um, I'm the host for the We Crochet podcast. So um, you can, if you like what you see here, you can hear me on the We Crochet podcast every two weeks. You can find that anywhere that you find podcasts. Um, I, I do sometimes do video. I was kind of just the hands in the video for yesterday, but, um, <gasps> that's why your voice sounds so familiar. <laughs> Cause I don't, I haven't listened to the We Crochet one, but the instructional videos and stuff. Nice. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Or, Sorry, or if you, I, I've been doing the ads on nitpicks podcast lately and I produce okay. the nitpick nitpicks podcast too. So, um, sometimes you'll hear my voice on there, but, uh, I like to spread, I like to let everybody do media. So <laughs> you, I don't know. Yes, I'm around. I'm around, all around. My fingerprints are everywhere. Everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. We are longtime fans of Knit Picks, both Emily and I and a lot of our viewers. So this is quite the treat for us this morning to be asking all the questions that we're excited about, that we want to know about Knit Picks. So thank you for spending some time with us. Thanks for having me. And I, you never know, I might have some, some, some tea to spill. We'll see. <laughs> yes. Well, we already know that you're a crafter, even if you hadn't introduced yourself in such a way, because I mean, just in your background alone, I see a sewing machine, <laughs> I see yarn. <laughs> yep. Plants. <laughs> yes. All the crafts. Yep. All the crafts. You epitomize the crafter. Well, before I worked for, for Knit Picks, I was a professional craft blogger. So, um, my website was dollarstorecrafts.com and then also craftfail.com, which is like a fail site for crafters. Like I tried to do this, but it turned out like this. So I wrote a book for that also. And um, yeah, so that's what I did Excellent. as a job before I started working for nitpicks. You are so talented. <laughs> You're like what we all dream of being in this knitting world or this crafting world. Yeah, some people just don't, don't do well in normal jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. love it. And I feel like I don't do well with the whole blogging thing. Like we've got a website. I haven't updated it in like a month or so. Yeah. Like, it overwhelms me. I mean, it's weird right now with blogs, right? Like it's social media is sort of more the, the where everything is. Um, yeah. yeah. I think you just keep doing what you like doing. Just go towards the things you like doing. And that's where you're going to find your success is not struggling to do things that aren't coming easy to you. So if it comes easy to you, that doesn't mean it comes easy to everyone else. It just means sure. that's one of your superpowers. So just double down on it. Awesome. I'm going to, I'm going to put a cape on that with my superpower. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, so are I, you also think... a life coach? Cause you just life coached us. <laughs> mm -hmm. up the oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can hire me for that. <laughs> life coach. Come on. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an old soul. I'm told when I was a little kid. Um, they, my grandma was from Norway and they called me bestemor, which means grandmother in, um, in Norwegian. Cause I guess I gave off the grandma vibe back then too. <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a niece. She won't be, she, she was on my latest audio, uh, episode, uh, the camping episode on little cabin knits. And, uh, so she, but she'll never come on here, you know, just doesn't 
do the video stuff but she makes all her own clothes so she's always wearing these beautiful like uh little um wait uh prairie house on the prairie oh yeah yeah mm-hmm. what's it called little house on the prairie yeah. thank you little house on the prairie kind of uh skirts and then she's always knitting these things for that she's fa- she found um Recently, she found a pair of knee-high sock pattern from, like, the 1800s. And she's trying to, like, uh, um, um, redo the patterns in normal nip speak. And so, and I'm just like, she's astounding. Anyway, so you remind me of her. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So there was something that you told us when we were just chatting before we started recording that I actually got really excited about that we that you guys have a We Crochet magazine. Yeah, let me start really quick by introducing We Crochet for people who might not know. Um, yes, so please. we're the sister brand of Knit Picks. It's all dedicated to crochet, um, and the website's crochet.com, but the brand is We Crochet. Um, but uh, we started it because there really isn't any resources that are direct that are um, for specifically crocheters. So, like Knit Picks had a cro- crochet section before, and they would release a few crochet patterns here and there. But nobody was really focusing on the crochet community, which is fairly different in vibe from the knitting community. So, with um, Crochet.com and We Crochet, we have a podcast, like I mentioned before, and we have a magazine, We Crochet Magazine. Um, it's released quarterly, and we usually have like 20 plus patterns, complete patterns in there, articles, interviews, tutorials. And it's, uh, if you have ever gotten one of the Knit Picks books, it's that same quality. So, it's more like a book than a magazine. Um, and it's, it's really gorgeous. I'm really, really proud of the magazine. That's so anyway, fantastic. if you're a crocheter, do come check us out because yeah. we've worked for two years to really create a community for crocheters and um, just kind of everything crochet. How well, do you think that the knitting community differs from the crochet community? Okay, well, I know that your I audience, <laughs> I know your audience is largely largely knitters, so I don't want to, I don't want to make anyone upset, but. Uh, <laughs> I would like to know the truth though. I mean, what, okay. what makes I, it I feel like generally yeah. knitters are a little more particular and crocheters are sort of more like, well, whatever, like all over the place, a little more improvisational or just, yeah. I don't know if anyone out there's a, a personality nerd, but like, I think, you know, if you're more loosey goosey or like, I don't know, just sort of gray area, you may gravitate more towards crochet. Whereas if you're, you like order and predictability, I think knitting um, can appeal to you more. And that's my armchair psych psych evaluation. So nobody, you know, it's not gospel or anything like that. But um, Mm -hmm. I am not a sporty person at all, but I kind of use a a sports analogy for this where when I was a kid, I tried skiing and it was so complicated. I had two things to keep track of on my feet and my skis would cross. And like, it was very like technical. Whereas when I tried snowboarding, it was much more like, get the board on your feet and then you you're kind of just cruising um that's a good you know, like the vibes of like skiers versus snowboarders yeah. are very different i uh, that's kind of how i see knitting and crochet that is yeah. a really good analogy because i being someone who primarily knits i have crocheted a little not very much i can see the relevance with that you know again one is not better than the other but right. they no. are very unique for yeah, sure yeah definitely i mean i I started as a knitter, actually. I learned to knit at a Stitch and Bitch group, you know, 15 or so years ago. Nice. Um, and it wasn't until one of the knitters was knitting a, a granny square scarf in mohair. I was like, white mohair. I was like, what? <laughs> That's amazing. I want to do that. So that was what motivated me to try to learn crochet. Um, and anyone out there who's worked with mohair and like crocheted, you know, like picking mohair for your first project for anything's not the easiest. But and so I don't think I really pulled off the granny square mohair, or met mohair <laughs> granny square, but I definitely started to learn crochet at that point. And then I kind of never really, I didn't do a lot of knitting after that. I did a bit of knitting, but not a ton. And I never really got that accomplished at knitting. Well, you found your groove and. Yeah. Yeah. The way that you describe it, I, you know, I've been thinking uh, about all the crocheters I know that are dominantly crocheters versus knitters. And I, I think I tend to agree with you. Like for instance, I'm thinking, 
I mean, I'm thinking about Cherry Hart at the moment because I have a pattern of hers that I want to do. Cherry Hart, um, she's very organized. And yet at the same time, when she shows you her crochet, uh, things that she's working on, it's always very organic. And she just says, well, I just had this idea and I wanted to try it out. And I think to myself, when I have ideas for knitting, I start to panic because I'm just like, I have no idea how I'm going to figure this out. There's, I just, I can't do it. And if somebody else hasn't figured it out before me, then I'm not, I'm not going to do this, you know? Yeah. Much like, more uh, rigid almost. Straight well, yeah. Also. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I, I, in my years as crafting, a crafting person and an artist, I've discovered process is what I care about. So that like doing it, getting down there, getting in the paints or whatever is, is the part that I like. So I'm not really big on planning in advance or like design I don't usually design before I work on something so um so I think like if you're a process person maybe crochet appeals to you more possibly um but I you know that being said I in my job at We Crochet I, I um work with influencers a lot and so and, and designers and just knitters and crocheters so I've had a ton of experience with different people and how they work so there's definitely a spectrum right it's not it's not everyone's just like a hot mess and crochet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are definitely people who are very organized and plan in advance and know exactly what they're going to do. Um, one of my old coworkers who used to be the We Crochet brand director, Sarah Dudek, is an amazing crocheter. She crocheted her own wedding dress. Um, oh, wow. I'm actually going to give her a shout out right now. You should go check her out on Instagram at Sarah Dudek Stitches. She just prolifically makes sweaters and they're just the most beautiful things you've ever seen oh, um yeah. she used to be the interweave crochet editor for the interweave crochet magazine and just so her her methods are much more design oriented the final product oriented versus the process um although she never you know she doesn't have trouble getting through the process but certainly she's got an, an image in her head of what she wants uh, at the end That's i awesome. just found her and I'm yeah. already jealous. We, Hold I on. think we shared we shared her wedding dress on the Instagram a long time ago. But yeah, yeah. Oh, she, nice. yeah. She's she just makes the most beautiful, stylish. Oh, <laughs> like I'm, I'm much oh more. Oh my like gosh. A, yeah. Is that part of the wedding dress or is that something no, else? No, but it does look sort of. It's it's that color, obviously. Um, but you know, I you have to scroll that. back quite a while to see her wedding dress. Um, yeah, because now it looks like she's got a kiddo. No, no, she doesn't. But, okay, um, she's okay. Dogs, I just saw a kid but... uh, on somebody's shoulder, so I was assuming. No, but... when we first started two years ago, she had just gotten married, and she she'd crocheted her entire wedding dress. That is so cool. How many people can say that they've done that? Let's be real. Not a lot. That yeah. is a big undertaking. Oh my gosh! Oh, you that found working? it. Wow, how did you find it that fast? That's amazing. You know, I'm a smart girl. I I, I feel of... like I scrolled her Instagram a couple weeks ago because I mentioned it to someone, and I it took me like an hour to find it. But... Oh my goodness! Well, that one wasn't a good enough picture, and I feel like okay. we need a, a <laughs> Sarah, better one. Sarah, are your ears burning? We're talking right, about you right now. We're crying I love, love right now. Sarah. I mean, she's <laughs> she makes the most just beautiful, and she's a designer also. She started designing when she was a child wow. so she's just like a really big crochet hero I would say that is amazing yeah yeah so well, tell us what else you do in your field or for you know knit picks or we crochet or how that works for you okay um so I recently just got this new position um before I was the marketing coordinator for we crochet and I really helped build the brand um so it was kind of like a team of a small team of a few of us making the whole brand. Um, so I, I would say my specialties, and since I mentioned superpowers, say that word again. Um, yeah, I, I have been a blogger for 20 years. So, and I was professionally blogging for 10 years. So writing is one of my huge strengths. Um, building social media is another one. I like I built my own page, like Facebook page, to 300,000 fans. So I just networking I don't want to say networking because that's not even it community building is really yeah. one of my main um strengths I would say so that's sort of where I've spent a lot of my energy is reaching out to crocheters crochet designers building um, relationships with people who knit and crochet and um yeah so that's mm -hmm. sort of where I like to spend my time well I have a question that following up on that then because 
there's that whole controversy right now about Ravelry, right? And you mentioned earlier about the Nitpicks uh, Ravelry group. Mm -hmm. So has, has that uh, kind of um, pushback from Ravelry, has it actually impacted you guys? And if so, how have you met that challenge? I, I haven't seen any evidence that it has affected us. I think most of our, our people who shop on Nitpicks either go directly there or are um, signed up to our email list. A lot of the people who get to us come to us from other places. Um, we definitely do still get a little bit of referral from Ravelry, but um, it, it, I don't think it's made a huge, huge dent. Um, we okay. have continued to upload our pattern or like, you know, put our pattern details and yarn details on Ravelry for the people who are using it still. Mm -hmm. um, and then for crochet, only there's only about 10% of Ravelry who are crocheters versus knitters. So it's not as much of a place where crocheters are finding us. They really find us more on Instagram. That would be like our main place where we're finding community. Yes. And yeah. silly question, is there a digital or like community like Ravelry for crocheters? I mean, I would say the closest thing would probably be either Facebook groups or just like interacting on Instagram. Um, yeah. Facebook groups are very different, like a very different vibe than Instagram, but the I definitely know that there are some really big groups yeah. on Facebook that... Um, focus on their fiber arts, but like a lot of crochet relation related. Yeah, like Marley Bird. Hers yeah, is like huge. Marley Bird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was always something that was interesting to me. My mother-in-law is a big time quilter. And I always thought, well, isn't there a Ravelry for quilting? Or isn't there a Ravelry for crochet? Or you would just think it would be an automatic thing, but I guess really, unless someone has specifically designed that or created that, that entity may not necessarily be there. Well, Ravelry is also sort of a throwback from the early 2000s um, in the sense that before we were all on Facebook, um, and I know a lot of people aren't even on Facebook anymore, but about yeah. 12, or, 12 or 13 years ago, Facebook really took over. But before that, um, online forums were really popular. So Ravelry is sort of fits in that niche from before. And it I think it kind of, like it t obviously is tapered down from when it first started, but um, it's still something that people are using. And that's not something that you can manufacture. That's really like a grassroots thing. Like you can never predict where people are going to want to congregate and spend their time. It's really building online communities, not as easy as it seems. So, yeah, well, I can tell you, I remember being long time community on nitpicks where you oh, guys yeah. had your community. And I'll tell you what, that was so much fun. You know, it, it wasn't necessarily as in depth as Ravelry, but it definitely met the need mm -hmm. and provided that common community amongst yeah. the crafters. And I, I loved that for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I'm, this, I'm definitely an online person. I made yeah. a lot of connections online and a lot of my best friends that I know are from online, whatever, various sources so yeah I definitely miss the forum days also um yeah. you know I feel like I don't know Facebook feels a little like Walmart like shopping at Walmart or something <laughs> where it's like okay like they own it now and there's just not as fun it's not the delight of of interacting with people is really not there anymore so I agree. Um, and Instagram starting to feel that way too yeah I mean and you know obviously just all the algorithms affecting everything we can't really yeah. control what we yeah. what we what information we get so it's, yeah. it's I don't know a problem for the 2020s I guess <laughs> yeah <laughs> right <laughs> well but I want to switch gears for just a second because you used a word earlier about Ravelry that I think also applies to nitpicks and it struck me that people might not really know the story of how nitpicks and we crochet oh, yeah. and the, and the quilting side too which I forgot what it's called it's connecting threads Connecting threads. That one too. how you guys came to be so that word you used was grassroots and to me nitpicks yeah. is definitely grassroots so I've only been in the company two and a half years so I wasn't here for this but it was started kind of as a mom and pop um yeah. catalog company mail order company really um and the founders were Bob and Kelly Petkin yeah Petkin was um kind of a a person who creates who creates community surrounding her. So she was sort of the, the hub she's, for. She's magnetic. Yeah. I miss her yeah. so much. 
she's an influencer, you know, an influencer in the classic sense of like people follow her and everyone wants to interact with her. So she was doing that for several years. I'm not sure exactly how long. Um, and the company grew and grew. Uh, so she was sort of, she was a knitter. So a lot of it was from like, this is what I would like. So I'm going to like, you know, pursue what I would like this, Mm -hmm. this level of quality of yarn, or I think she was the first one to make the the laminate wood with a colorful needles um yeah. needles and you know that was her idea and um I know that she really let people into her personal life too and she was talking on her on the nitpicks podcast or doing videos or um writing blog posts so I think I think people really respond when when you're willing to share yourself online like that and and allow yourself to be seen people mm-hmm. always respond yeah. Is she and, still part of anything anymore? Um, no, I think she retired. So she's not actively involved at all now. Um, you know, as companies grow, things kind of have to morph and, and mom and pop shops, you know, mom and pops want to age out, of, you know, like yeah. leave it and do something yeah. else. And then um, other people take over. And obviously the flavor changes a little bit. The way things are, it's a little different. Um, and so and I you're... thought it was still in the family because I thought her son uh, took yeah, over. The CEO is, is Matt Petkin, Bob's son. Okay. Yeah. 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 But he's not, you know, actively running nitpicks. So, you know, he's, Got he's it. doing CEO stuff. And, and, CEO we all... stuff. <laughs> yeah. yes. and he seemed like, I mean, I can't remember. I'm, I might be talking out of my, <laughs> but um <laughs> I thought he came on her podcast. When yeah, he, he was, definitely okay. did. Yeah, he and, came on when he started, I think. And he right, went, and he was very honest about the fact that he is not a crafter. Like, he's yeah. tried these things, and, but that he's very much more business-oriented. Yeah. And I could see the difference once he took over in that, it, it, like, like, the marketing in and of itself just grew ten, tenfold. But mm-hmm. the quality of things... And the uh, the ad- and the adventure that mm-hmm. has that from all of the different yarns you guys produce. Yeah. I came to Knit Picks because I wanted quality, but I also wanted something I could afford. Like for instance, mm-hmm. City Tweed, yeah. right? D- um, and and we were talking on our last episode, Steph, about how Knit Picks has now grown. Where what did you call them? The specialty yarns? They do. They, and forgive me for speaking, correct me if I'm wrong, Heather, you have a quality classic line of all of these yarns, but then you offer what I consider specialty yarns and they are a little more pricey. They are a little more exquisite, but it's done in a way that is, it doesn't make you feel like if you can't afford that, you're not a you're not a quality crafter. It's just, right. here's what we're offering. If you'd like to take part in this, we'd love for you to enjoy it. And I, I love the way that nitpicks always come across. We have something for everyone. That's great. Yeah. That's great to hear. Um, I always think of us sort of like, if anyone out there is familiar with Trader Joe's, like, you know, their prices are low, but they have really cool stuff yes. and they're sort of cutting out the middleman, making their own products. And yeah. that's kind of what we do too. So a yeah, lot of what you it. see um, on our website is very similar to what you would see in your local yarn store, but the prices, mm-hmm. um, the savings is being passed on to you. Yeah. And on one of the other things that I really have enjoyed is like the, the employee's input is heard. Cause I remember I, well, I don't know, have any idea how long ago this was, but I was listening to the podcast and one of the, the, people on there, it might have even been you, I don't know, was talking about how they were sensitive to wool and how nitpicks listened to that. And now they were announcing uh, their cotton line above and beyond. Oh no, I forgot the the classic dishy. We have have different choices. I mean, I think probably one of our like special sauces is um, that everyone on our team is a crafter and we all care about knitting and crochet or sewing or whatever, like everybody is very enthusiastic about the topic. So it's not like a bunch of business drones just trying to like push a button to get money out of knitters at all. Um, Mm -hmm. We all care about it. We all have rooms like this in our in our house where there's yarn piled up everywhere. And, um, you know, every day when we were in the office, we're still remote now. Um, you know, we'd be like, oh my gosh, I finished my sweater. I'm wearing it today. Or, you know, here's the blanket that I just made. I'm bringing it to my cubicle so you can see it. Um, you know, so we're all very much 
the people who we're selling to, we are a member of that same community. That's awesome. Wouldn't that just be amazing to work in that environment? It's fun. I know that part's really great. Sign me up. (laughs) I know, right? So last week we had a company um, barbecue. I wasn't able to attend because I had a family emergency. But one of the things that I was preparing for that is that I was going to have a craft uh, show off your crafts table because of all in the pandemic. And, you know, so I'm a, I'm a very, um, so we have about 200 employees and I'm very much present. Like they see me all the time in my role. I'm always coaching them and, you know, many other yeah. things. And they're always asking me about what I'm knitting. And then we, this organic conversation of crafting begins, but nobody knew that they were crafters, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I wanted to start this, community within my organization of hey you're a crafter I'm a crafter let's share this I want to learn about yours and mm-hmm. I just hope it went off well I haven't I haven't even bothered to ask because <laughs> I'm so afraid people love that I mean all that we all we want in life is to be seen and like connected with and appreciated and accepted right so like Mm -hmm. if if Susie's making a quilt and she gets to bring it to work and five or six people are ooing and aahing over or 50 or 60 people then how great of a connection is that with your coworkers? I mean that really deepens the relationship that you would have with them in a good way Yeah. yeah yeah definitely and I see that happen again and again and again. I mean, and then you hear stories of people. Um, the commuter knitter always talked about how she would be knitting, um, you know, in transit and Boston Jen too, in transit, uh, their commute. I knew that word. Um, yeah. And people would always ask them organically about what they're knitting and stuff. And, and I see that happening in my life, not so much now because we're not out in public like you said but I miss those days I think I think it's like for the last hundred years we've had you know things manufactured for us we just go to the store and buy it there's a like a lack of connection to where you live or the the land that you live on or the your house like you didn't build it the clothes that you wear but before that I mean it's very intrinsically human to be creating all the time and making things um, to yes. either, you know, for practical reasons or to enhance your life. Um, like you were mentioning, Erin, that your your niece was looking at this old pattern. Well, an 1800s knitting pattern, that would have been essential, right? Because I would have been making the, the socks for my kids. That, like in my yeah. spare time, I wouldn't have been on my phone because there wasn't one. I wouldn't have been watching TV. Like my entertainment would have been a productive hobby like making sweaters or Mm -hmm. stockings or whatever so I think that everyone wants to I think even people who don't think they're crafty they just it's because they have this idea in their mind of what crafty means but I think humans really do want to make things and I think it's a component that has been missing from modern society and makes us feel sad when we don't have a place to to practice creativity so well And I liken it to this, this concept. Uh, So um, I'm a trauma therapist and uh, one of the the newest uh, advances in our research is that we now know that trauma impacts and actually changes your DNA. Now I'm not talking about short-term trauma. I'm talking about long-term trauma, Mm -hmm. but I, I got, I, uh, as you were talking about this, I was like, you know what? for centuries, and I'm not just talking a thousand years, I'm talking 4,000 years. This has been in our DNA to create, to yeah. make, to craft. And so you're, I think you're spot on there. I would not be surprised if this wasn't honestly in our DNA makeup and that yeah. people are aching but to get back to that tactile experience. And they feel like there's just this barrier of, Oh, I can't. Yeah. I don't know how. Yeah. Well, I think, I think we have a lot of us have imposter syndrome with like, Oh, so-and-so is a knitter, but I'm not, I just yeah. not, like a lot of, we see this a lot in crochet. Actually, a lot of crocheters consider themselves beginners oh. because they think someone else out there is so much better than them, but really they're yeah. more like intermediate or intermediate, you know, it, and sure. it, it doesn't even matter because if you know the basics, you're a crocheter, like you, 
if you want to crochet mm-hmm. and you are crocheting, you're a crocheter. If you want to be an artist and you make art, you're an, you're an artist. If you want to be a writer and you write, you're a writer. You know, it's not, I think it's easy to fool ourselves into thinking that because it's not to the standard of a professional that we're seeing that we're not that thing, but that's actually a fallacy. And um, so remind yourself, you yes. are that thing. You're, you're doing it, then yes. you're that thing. That's the literal definition of being a knitter is picking up your, your needles and knitting. Yes. Well, and it's one of those things I personally truly enjoy. I have always had a group of knitters at my local library, wherever we have lived. And I cannot tell you how many times these wonderful ladies and gentlemen have said to me, oh, but you never make a mistake. <laughs> I'm thinking, um, but I do. I, I, I totally do. I am human. I may have been knitting X amount of years, but that doesn't erase the fact that I too have ripped my sweater out now for the third time. Yeah. And it's okay to do so. It's okay because yeah. then I learn how to fix it. I learn how to do all these things. But I think more than anything, just the encouragement to people who are new crafters encourage them. Don't ever think, oh, mine's not good enough. It's yeah. not whatever. That's Build someone's that voice in your head, right? Like your mom's yes. voice or whatever in your head being like, you're never going to be good at that. So you might as well not try. Yeah. Like a lot of people, I'm a singer. So um, I've had a lot of people be like, I wish I could sing, but I can't. And I'm just like, you know what? I think singing is a human, right? Like you don't have to be singing as a performer in front of other people, right. but you should feel free to sing in the car along with your favorite song or at your house, like, or whenever you want, because that's yeah. again, another like intrinsically human thing that we should yeah. all be allowed to participate in. Um, yeah so you may not be the soloist but you can definitely be in the choir yeah I mean (laughs) we don't all have to be the the number one dog um that's that's part of the human the full human spectrum of experience is like do the try the things you want to try and if you fail Mm -hmm. that's uh, I'm such a like huge proponent of failure like I said I had a site called craft fail and I really loved I really learned to embrace failure because you can't adults for some reason feel like they need to be perfect at something when they try something and um when you become an adult you kind of lose touch with the feeling of learning something new um so i say this on the podcast the we crochet podcast a lot but when you try something new and you feel super frustrated that feeling is the literal feeling of learning that's like your brain firing and trying to make connections in your brain to like help you learn things yes you just have to like be like instead of just being like, I can't do this, I, I quit. You have to be like, that's the feeling of me learning. I am improving, Yeah. you know, it's, but as an adult, we kind of expect ourselves to be so good at everything, even when we've never yeah. tried something before. So like Agreed. if your kid picked up a knitting needle and was like, oh, could I try, how, how do I do this? And they yeah. didn't really do a very good job. You wouldn't be like, you, you stink <laughs> at that. You're so terrible. You should just quit now, right? You would be like, keep going. It's, yes. it's all right, sweetie. That's You're right. doing so good. Yeah. yeah. So I, I try to, I've adopted in my like last 10 years of life, kind of trying to treat myself like I would treat my kids. Mm-hmm. I call myself sweetie instead of like, oh, you big dummy. Why'd you do that? I'm just like, mm-hmm. okay, sweetie, let's try again. Or, you know, yes. like, cause I would never say to my kid, oh, that, you know what you failed because, right. you know, blah, you know, so yeah. well, I should extend that same courtesy to myself and the same Agreed. love to myself. Agree. Oh, I just love that. You just life coached us again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for letting me. I feel like I've been stuck in my house. Like my desk is next to the bathroom. Like I'm just like <laughs> sitting next to the bathroom for 18 months. So it's nice to have a conversation with someone. <laughs> Well, like I was saying, I have had to um, do some surgery on my sweater. I am, thank you, Heather, still demoing the Wonder Fluff by Nick. So cute. I love that color. Oh, the Cosmopolitan colorway. Mm. And I, you know, missed some increases. So it ended up a child size sweater. So I had to rip it back out, pick up back to where I had to, you know, split for sleeves. But guys, to really give you an idea of the integrity of this yarn. I have ripped it out three times and between what I have wound up again and the actual yarn itself, you would not know the difference. It has been so exciting to, I don't want to say mess up, but in a sense, really get a feel for how well this yarn is going to withstand to, you know, rub, wear, all of those types of things. I am 
thrilled and can 100% say, if you don't have this in your stash, you need to get some. Is your sweater light too? Like when you lift it up, does it feel pretty light? The, the weight of the needles is actually what there is. It is so light, yeah. so airy, oh, but fun. it kind of gives that feel of a soft mohair where it's going to be super warm, but still very breathable. And I'm very excited. So this is a cropped sweater. And then you go back, pick up the arms, and then it, it's a rolled big boat turtleneck. Nice. So I'm super excited about that. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Yeah, Steph, do so you feel comfortable like standing up and showing where it's hitting you on your waist oh, now? Because I, I just thought that my was head, But yes, I can do that. So if it's uh, on my arms here, and then right here, my actual hip bone is right here. So it will probably come right to that hip bone right there for that nice clean look, right? With, you know, a skirt, shorts, pants, what have you, but any of those dark black, navy, gray. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, yeah. That. Hot um, pink and, and navy is such a cute combination. Right? Pink and yeah. navy. So how about well, you then? How's your sweater? Well, I mean, Steph and I always talk about how we want to knit things that we can um, wear with more things in our wardrobe. And then when, uh, Heather, when you approached me to, uh, to, to do some, um, some knitting, you know, your new high desert yarn probably would have been awesome or no, probably would have been wiser of me to have chosen a gray or a natural, but no, <laughs> because I can't help myself. I saw this color on, on the, sh on the website, which is, um, Lupin and I just had to do it. So just a reminder, I am knitting the Summer Festival cardigan. Mm -hmm. And full disclosure, with everything that's been going on this week, I have not picked up, I think I knit a row yeah. since I've been back from camping. Mm -hmm. So have we recorded since I, no, no, we recorded before I went camping. Okay. But you did a fair amount when you were camping. Yeah. I yeah. actually got so engrossed in it during the camping trip that I went past by about two inches <laughs> where I was supposed to start the front details. And I just said, I don't care. It's going to be an extra long sweater. That'll be totally fine. Um, but let me try and find, where is it? So I've are, started. You find, are you, you still see loving the knit and the feels? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. So. I mean, oh, it doesn't look like anything much, but I've done one repeat of the, I mean, I don't know what this is. Is this, does this look like a flower to you? Does it look like a square, a square circle or kind thing? Of like a Nobody knows. Cable, cable lace. That's what yeah. I would say. Kind of looks a little like Celtic lace or something. Yeah. So I'm super excited about it. I, I can't just, I can't necessarily tell you what the lace is but it's a lace that I have never done before and when I do it I keep thinking to myself this isn't going to add up right and then it does in the end and I'm like Emily you just got to stop I thinking. I always feel that way I'm like this looks wrong this is going to be bad and then I'm yeah. just like it's kind of like that feeling of frustration I was talking about before but it's like that doubt you're like okay, I just have to keep going with it. I just got to keep going. Exactly. And so as long as we keep on, like, I mean, okay, so trust in and of itself, this concept of trust in and of itself is extremely hard to comprehend, to get and to receive, I mean, yeah. to receive yeah. and to give. It is. And yet we just naturally are expected to have this, the trust in these designers if, that we don't know from Adam, right? Yeah. So um, it's always nerve wracking to me, especially when it's around lace. When it's color work, not so much, but around lace in particular and a garment, mm -hmm. I, I have trust issues. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's true. So, yeah. And I think Stephanie does now too. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness but we're on the we're on the mend I've got everything ready to go so yeah, yeah. I, I want to shout out that that high desert yarn that you're using the purple there yes. um let me just tell your audience about it in case they don't know it's an all-american yarn and so um basically we're working with a co-op farm co-op that that raises sheep 
um, for this really high quality wool. So and then cool. we have it dyed and spun in the United States. So it's all just completely made in the USA. Um, so you might notice like the price points higher than our typical knit picks, but it's like made in the USA. And we're really, we feel like we're really making um, a positive impact in our community in Oregon and in, in the West, the, um, the American West, working with all of these farmers who are doing this and used to sell their, their wool as a commodity. And, you know, they'd never see it. They wouldn't know what happened to it. It would just be, they'd get a price for it and move on. Now yeah. they can see it's being made into this beautiful yarn. And then yeah. that yarn is being made into beautiful garments um, or, or projects. Uh, yeah. It's really impressive. I, if anyone, if that, that idea is resonating with anyone, I definitely recommend going to the Knit Picks podcast and listening to the interview yes. with the owner of the Shanico or the founder of the Shanico Ranch Company, um, wool company who we work with to produce that. She goes into great detail about the level of impact that it makes on her community. How many well, farms are in that cooperative? I don't know. I actually don't know that. Um, I don't know that she said that in her interview and I don't, it's not, I don't know that we have that information, but um, you know, I know that she individually recruits ranches cool. and says, you know, Hey, we can, this is what our vision is. We want to do this thing. And um, it's, yeah, it's really admirable and really inspiring. I was really inspired when I listened For to the sure. interview with her. That's well, awesome. and that's, that, first off, you you corrected how I was pronouncing this because I was calling it Shaniko and so it's Shaniko. <laughs> <laughs> you know how regional regional names are. Yes. You never yes. quite know how they might be pronounced, so that's fine. <laughs> and so just so everybody knows, it's episode 343, High Desert Yarn with Jean, Jean Carver? Jeanie. Jeannie. Okay. Jeannie Carver. Yeah. And we'll um, link that below for all of our nice. um, subscribers so they can just make yes. a quick link over there. Yeah, do listen and, to that. I mean, I I was, I just was really inspired by their whole mission, um, and it really made the price point make sense to me too, um, because I know a lot of us are like, I'm not going to spend that much money on yarn, but if you know that the the families who are creating that, like, it's just really, in a small way, making a difference that we want to make in the world, you know? Absolutely, so. and. We've Very been talking cool. a lot. I mean, we've we, we've always talked about supporting local, but this last year it's become even more prominent. I mean, I remember watching YouTube channels about the devastation of the wool market over in the UK, how people yes. are literally just burning them or throwing them away. Yeah. Um, and uh, so you guys are really. I, I mean, I don't hear. I don't. I don't hear anything about the American wool market. And nothing. No, not me neither. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I think part of it was like, we were looking last year when, um, you know, the pandemic started and there was logistical problems. Everyone knows about also sort of boring. So we don't need to go into it, but like, we, we were just like, what else can we do? Mm -hmm. And, and people want to be able to buy things from the U S it's, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't want to get into capitalism problems, but you yeah, know, it's, but it, it was part partially problem solving, but like it became something much more than that. Yeah. Yeah. That's really and admirable. I, yes. That's what I was going to say. And, um, you know, I've met some, you know, at, at, um, Madrona up in, uh, Tacoma, Washington. Is that where it's at? Uh, where they hold Madrona every year. Uh, yeah. I've met some lo local, um, people who, well, in fact, these guys here, oops, all of this yarn is by a, a, mi a local mill in Washington, oh, yeah. Lannis, yes. Lannis Lana. And I absolutely love her stuff, mm -hmm. but that's the only time I ever hear about um, actual homegrown mills, things like that, you know? It's very rare to hear about it anymore. Yeah, I mean, you know, and just as the globalization has happened with stuff, you know, there's reasons why businesses do what they do. But, um, you yeah. know, it's, I think, move, I don't know, maybe the theme of this talk is sort of like getting back to our roots and just thinking like, where do we come from and, and where are we going? And do we want to go there? You know, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. that's kind of on my mind a lot right now. It's just sort of, am I on the train that I want to be on? And I don't really know how to get off of it necessarily, but like, yeah, you have to think about it first before you can go anywhere, you know, you have to consider it and, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. 
So we would like to know something. Can you tell us, um, is there anything new from nitpicks? Is there anything we should be watching for? Is there anything you can dish out for us? I feel like you're getting at something, but I'm going to make you come out and say it. (laughs) (laughs) We are fans of socks. We love to knit socks. And forever and ever and ever, ourselves, our fans, people who watch, we have fallen in love with the Felici yarn. Every year with the new color line, you know, the feeling of I'm going to get it before it goes discontinued and then I'm going to have it and Mm -hmm. you hoard it because it's so exciting to get that. So if you can give us any information, we will surely love to let our Behind Nits and Pearls (laughs) podcast for people know. You need to work on your directness, but. um... (laughs) I'm trying, I'm trying. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Um, Okay, first, I'm going to tease you and talk about some things I like about Felici. Um, So one cool thing uh, in the office is that we are, we open it up to everyone in the office to be able to create or like pitch Felici colorways. So that's one of all of us love it when we are, we get that assignment to, to give color ideas. Um, And so my first time that I did that, the colorway that I, there's been several of mine that have been picked, but my favorite one is the hamburger colorway that came out about a year ago. Yeah, um, yeah that was my first, I was like, ah, I need to make a hamburger Felici. Oh, so that was all me. Um, um, I think in that same batch, there was one named Augie too, which is my kid's name. So that was kind of fun also, just like cool. uh, some insider information. And then I know a lot of people are like, where are they getting these names from? Um, usually what we do is we get when we, we submit the color samples to the mill, they then get back to us with um, samples that we can look at. And a lot of times it doesn't turn out the way that we want just because of the limitations of dye and stuff. So I know a lot of times people are like, what were they thinking? Sometimes we just can't hit what we want, you know? Um, <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, when we get those samples, we look at them all and then that's when we name them. And so we kind of just all as a group are there as like an improv group or something like shouting out ideas of what, what that colorway makes us think of. Um, so that's kind of another fun thing that we get to do as a team. And it's such an art and not a science. Like a lot of times the name is similar to like, you're like, what were they thinking? It's we're all throwing out names and once everyone's like, yes, or, or like, yeah, that's pretty good. And we can't think of anything better than that's when they get named. Um, <laughs> but this is breaking news that you are getting the scoop on. Um, we do have Felici coming soon and it is coming at the end of July. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so stay tuned. We're almost there. We're getting there. And we have a bunch of new fun colors um new crazy names and uh we all we love I think we love Felici as much as everyone else does too we all you know I I saw a ball of it at the um the office yesterday because I was in the office and we have a everyone out there's gonna be super jealous when I say this I'm really sorry but um (laughs) we have a a a shelf full of free yarn and free fabric at work so because we get so much stuff going through the office that we just need to move it out and I saw a ball of Felici and I was like should I should I take it but I already have so much I can't like I have so much yarn I can't I'm just like no no more yarn no more yarn but when the new colors come out I'm probably gonna have to pick up some of them (laughs) that is awesome well thank you for sharing that because like I said not just Emily and I but a lot of the people who follow us and whatnot it's the yarn that everyone has because it's so great for gifting to non-knitters who don't know how to take care of wool, who I accidentally threw it in the dryer and it's still okay, yeah. you know? Yeah, anyone out there who's making gift knits and not thinking about that, definitely think about the fiber content of what you're choosing. Yeah, And even for yourself, if you're just making it for yourself, think like, do I need to wash this thing? If so, <laughs> plan for that with your yarn choice. Um, yes. Or like, how yep. heavy will this be when I knit it up? Or Um, I mean, I think those are all things you learn as you go too, but especially if you're making gifts, stick with the easy care yarns, um, you know, washable is best. My mom, most people don't know that she shrunk so many socks (laughs) (laughs) until she finally figured it out. And you know, but even though I always told her, like, you have to wash these ones by hand, but, but I, okay. So I, I want to know one little extra thing. So you said that you came up with some of the colorways that got picked. Uh, You also helped with the naming. 
are, is there any of the new line that you can tell us you had a hand in? Oh that we gosh. Uh, may, I definitely did have to do some colors. Okay, let me think. There's one that's rainbow bright inspired colors. Oh. And that one was mine. I don't remember what we ended up naming it, but it's like blue, pink, yellow, white, red, maybe. I don't know. I don't remember exactly. Well, it the has color. to be rainbow bright, or maybe yeah. that's a. It's a, it's a kind of a, a retro, you know, you retro go. looking thing. So I did that one. Um, I don't remember. I, I think there's one or two other ones, but it's that's the amount of time that it takes. It's like it's been like nine months or something since we submitted those colors so it just takes the whole timeline is really long so you kind of forget yeah. what what happened unless it was significant like hamburger yeah <laughs> yeah well okay so then that brings up okay I'll, I'll ask this one last question but that about nitpicks and then I want to ask about you a little bit more um so we, the, in the fashion industry they always talk about how they have to be planning is it what a year in advance and stuff like yeah that? minimum yeah so how do you guys figure out what's going to be popular? You, you're, you're future tripping yourselves, yeah. in essence, but you're always succeeding. So maybe it's not a trip. I think <laughs> if you just kind of think about like where in the coolness, newness timeline you are, we're not like the cutting edge of all yarn companies who's coming out with like the most, you know, we we can follow the market a little bit. So like, you know, in fashion week this week, what this, this year, whatever colors are hot, we can start putting them into production now. And by the time um, people are really wanting those colors, we'll have them um, except for the mm -hmm. big trend centers. I know like, I know when I was sewing a lot, I never could find the colors of fabric that I was looking for um, because it just did that lag time and you know the Pantone color of the year you might not be able to just find it right when they name the Pantone right. color of the year because we don't know what it is until it comes out so yeah um, you know it's there's a bit of a lag but I think even with how fast fashion can change now and the I think the way the cycles work there's sort of like a long timeline where something is cool like I'm wearing a copper shirt right now this color has been popular for five years at least it'll probably be mm -hmm. popular for another five years mm -hmm. so it's great that because knitting takes yeah. such a long time you can still get a color like the season after it started debuted wear that color for you know multiple yeah. years and um, yeah it's still going to be relevant in fashion nice. yeah I think about the sea foam green colors and the coral colors they have been popular for what, three to five years as well? At least, yeah. I do not see those going out of fashion no, anytime soon. No, no mm -hmm. it's, I, th I think colors stick around for about 10 years or something. Um, that um, stuff, the, the, the hot pink and, and navy, that's been popular for a couple of years, but it's still, it takes different people, different amounts of time to adopt a new color or style. So I think it just takes, it, it, there's, there's actually a, a lot bigger of a timeline than you think. I think also we're not teenagers anymore. So, you know, we don't have to be like right? wearing what the teenagers are wearing this week and then changing it next week. It's a little more forgiving when you're an adult. So, right. and, and, it, and it's a little that. more about expressing yourself <laughs> versus like just participating in the culture and what's cool yeah. in the culture. So um, that being mm -hmm. said, I, we want to encourage younger knitters and younger crocheters to, to, to pick up the craft um, or, or just younger people. So we are always looking for ways to appeal to the younger knitter. Yeah. Um, and it's a process and you know, everyone, on our, most people on our staff are a little older. We're not 20 year olds. There are a few 20 year olds, but mm -hmm. so, you know, it's a balance of like, how can we serve the people who we are already serving and also appeal to some new people and, um, you know, just kind of yeah. keep it relevant and fresh. Yeah. yeah. But I will say that I've been seeing a whole lot more, at least on YouTube, younger podcasters, yeah. like yeah. in their early twenties. Yeah. And I think it's so cute when they talk about, I've been knitting for so long. <laughs> I started at 18. Yeah. I'm 21. And I was like, Oh, girlfriend. That's a, long, a big percentage of your life, years. right? Like, yeah. you know, if you're that age, that is a long time. And also, kids that when you're in your younger years you have time to devote to learning like I don't know my kids I have all boys all sons and you know they play video games and I'm like I'm never gonna get good at that video game because I'm not 13 and I don't have six hours a day to like <laughs> figure out the move so 
Exactly. Like, I'll watch you, but I'm not going to do that because I don't have that right. time. But if you can find the hobby that you love at a younger age, like knitting, you can really level up as fast as you want because you just yeah. have a little bit more time. Yeah. Sorry out there, anybody who's like, I'm 20 and I don't have time. Like, yeah. I think we all feel like that, but yeah, you'll find as you get older, yeah. <laughs> there are other things that you have to do that you can't not do. So, yeah. Right. Like, I mean, like, I mean, I'm not even a parent. Uh, 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 sorry, just the word a parent. It, it sounded like I was saying I'm, <laughs> I'm not a parent. the other one. But anyway, but, you know, I am a grown adult with uh, a lot of responsibilities. Yeah. And it just killed me this week that I literally couldn't even get in mm. one stitch. Yeah. And yeah, I, it's either just, that or this, right? Like mm -hmm. either I do mm -hmm. my laundry or I can knit a row. Um, yep. And, and it just drives me crazy. Everybody just needs no. to. Okay. Wait, Steph, you had an idea for our third quarter. Maybe this is a good time to talk about that, that 30 sure. minutes a day. Um, so we have split our year in two quarters this year and we were working on the first part of it being getting your stash organized get it prepared figure out what's in your stash what kind of yarn do you have do you need to sell some do you need to downsell? what what is your situation um patterns. yep patterns as well because that's all part of the organizational process um this last if you want to do the last quarter emily we've been focusing on uh, patterns and organization. And if you guys go back to last episode, uh, I've forgotten the name of it. <laughs> the last one. Yeah. Our previous episode, we talked a lot about it because, um, we have a giveaway about organizing yes. all of your patterns and your, yes. um, projects that you have on the go. And so we were talking about how there was all different methods, methodologies of organizing your patterns. I'm doing it digitally, which yep. I think is probably my least favorite way to do it because I forget what I yeah. have on my computer. And I'm Whereas, a paper person, so. Yes, and you can just flip through. I, I, okay, I get so annoyed when I open up a file and then I just leave it open. And then at the end of the day, I have like 14,000 files I have to close up down before <laughs> I can close my computer. It just annoys me. <laughs> so, I mean- it's not that that happened just last night, <laughs> you know? right? Right. But so there's just all kinds of ways, and there's and then there's ways like you can organize them via type. You can uh, yeah. like hat, shawl, sweater. Mm -hmm. You can organize them alphabetically. You can organize yeah. them by designer. I mean, the ideas are limitless. And yes. some I, some people gave some ideas on the on the last episode, mm -hmm. and I promised that I yeah. would give away from oh my goodness I, I lost it a girl and her wool I was going to call her something completely different <laughs> the the organizational labels and stickers I'm not going to take them out because I, right. They're all it took together. me forever to get them looking pretty again um but they're so beautiful and the I used random number generator to pick from the comments from last week and it was post number six from good golly miss molly and so my friend, good golly, Miss Molly, if you will either private message me on Instagram uh, between knits and pearls, we will get this out to you. Or you can email me at between knits and pearls at gmail.com. Yep. Do not message me on Ravelry. It's the <laughs> she worst place. Read them. <laughs> I never read. I mean, I think it was two weeks ago. I went back on there and I found uh, messages from Steph from like, December <laughs> I know and not, I was just, like it's not your space it's all right you just don't use no. it like that that's okay no no uh so yeah go ahead and message me good golly miss molly I'm so excited for you to get these and okay. yes so anyway but then now leading into the so third, third quarter third quarter we kind of Emily and I talked about this idea of and I, I hope this comes across the right way. We want to do something with knitting and exercising. And so we thought about, you know, exercise is so individual. Some people are walkers. Some people are runners. Some people are crazy gym rats. Some people don't like exercising. Some people just 
don't. And so we thought about what is a healthy balance between our crafting and our well being for our own health? And we thought about what if everyone set their own goals? Because again, just like knitting, crafting, um, organizing, organizing, it's all yeah. individual. So I said for myself, what if every hour that I spend knitting, 10 minutes needs to be exercise that next day? So if I knit for you know, three hours, I need to do something physical for 30 minutes to help my health, my mental status, so that I'm kind of, I don't want to say offsetting because there's nothing wrong with crafting and spending that time doing that, but bring an awareness to your health and doing so. And so we thought about doing that. And again, we'd love to hear your guys' input as to, do you like it? Do you not? Is it something you're interested in? Um, but again, goal setting for you as an individual, because what I choose may be best for me, but it might not be best for Heather. It might not be best for Emily. Right. So that was our thought for maybe third quarter. And we'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Yeah. And you guys may remember that I'm in an unfortunate circumstance where I tore my, oh crap. Was it a tendon or a ligament? I think it was a tendon that connects my, my bad leg on my right leg to my hip. That was about six weeks ago. And I was complaining to Steph before we started recording mm -hmm. that I still can't go to the gym, that yeah. I just ended seeing my PT therapist because she's, she was afraid that we were just tearing it repeatedly mm -hmm. with PT instead of it's healing. Mm -hmm. And every time I go for a walk, by the, I love the walk, but when yeah. I get back, I am, my leg is just burning. Yeah. So... I can't do the same goal as, as Steph is doing right now. Yeah. So for me, instead, I'm focusing on the mental health aspect mm -hmm. of the knitting. And I'm saying for my mental health self-care, mm -hmm. I'm going to dedicate 15 minutes a day to knitting. And that knitting is going to be without TV, without audio podcasts, uh, anything else. It's just me my and my wool. Mm -hmm. And probably my dog in my lap because he, of course, can't leave me alone. So, so I'm taking yeah. it that route. And so the beauty of it is there are no rules. There is no right. There is no wrong. You make your goals for what's going to benefit you the best. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, Heather, I'm not asking you to do this. But if you were to do this, <laughs> what goal would you set? Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, well, I like what you just, first of all, let me just say, I like what you just said about kind of mindfully knitting. What I would do if I was doing that is make like do breathing while I'm doing it, sort of like knit it, knit, breathe in, hold it for however many stitches. And then, you know, that's kind of where I would go in terms of, for me, if that feels super, that sounds like it'd be very mm -hmm. calming and relaxing. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I don't know. It's so hard because we've had in Portland, I live in Portland, Oregon, and it's been like 115 degrees this week. So I'm like, I'm never going outside again. Um, so I'm not sure. Maybe some sit-ups, maybe like alternate a row with like sit-ups, push-ups, lunges, mm -hmm. whatever, crunches, um, yoga, stretching. Ah. Um, I think yoga stretching, like I'm in my forties, that's really like life saving right now, yes. <laughs> especially yes. sitting down at my computer all day, working from home, you know, yeah. that kind of thing even would be something where I would, I'd probably start there, like start kind Absolutely. of minimal, but impactful. Absolutely. And one too, I mean, people don't realize, you know, just stopping what you're doing and even for five minutes going and doing something in the yard or stretching your arms or stretching, that is exercise. That is cardiovascular. And that will absolutely change your mood, your mindset, and how you move forward in that day. It doesn't have to be a full-blown workout somewhere, you yeah. know? I'm always looking for like, how can I blow off steam to like, just as a stress reducer? Because I don't know, I feel like in my older years, I, sorry that I'm saying I'm old. I don't think I'm old, but like <laughs> where I am now, I yeah. feel like it's so hard to find an outlet for blowing off steam. I think maybe the pandemic has something to do sure. with it. You can't just go do the things you're used to doing. Like I used to do karaoke and that was like stress relieving. Yeah. Like I'm always looking like, where can I blow up? How do I blow off steam? Mm -hmm. So yesterday I went out in the kiddie pool with my seven-year-old and 
splashed, we splashed each other. He sprayed me. I screamed. And that was, that was really cathartic. You know, I, yeah. I mean, like as much as you don't want to be sprayed right. <laughs> afterwards, I was like, oh, okay. I feel a little better now. You know, it just, I felt like it was a stress reliever. So That's just kind awesome. of looking for those daily moments where just whatever small thing you can do can make a little bit of a difference in how you're feeling. Yep. So that's our idea for third quarter. We hope to hear from you guys. Heather, I cannot thank you enough for spending time with us today. This was a real treat and a real joy. Thank you so much. It's also been really fun for me. Good. And I, I, I just want to say, I didn't even get through a quarter of the questions that I have for you. <laughs> oh, so no, I'll, you'll have to oh, come back. Sure. I'll have to come back. Yeah. I was yes. going to just say that. I'm your new you unofficial another co-host part of now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll just invite myself. <laughs> You know what? You might want to change your social media name to Knitter Life Coach or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, I, I feel like Life Coach is like a name someone else bestows upon you. But like once you're like, I'm a Life Coach, that's a little suspect, you know, suspect. <laughs> yeah. Actually, my supervisor. My friends call me a life coach. Yeah. <laughs> I've been called by many people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it's funny because I guess maybe the idea is kind of stuck in my head right now because my my old supervisor um, and mentor, she was actually just recently telling me, Emily, your style of therapy is very much more of a life coach. Have you ever That's thought it. of opening your own private practice for life coaching? And I was just like, <laughs> Please don't give me another idea. I know. Oh gosh. Yeah. Let's not talk about ideas right now. I won't be able yeah. to stop talking. So exactly. I know you need an end to this. So I know. I'll allow so, that. so thank you. Like Steph yes. said, thank you, Heather, so much. And thank you for always being so responsive to my emails and being patient with me and responding to of your course. emails. <laughs> uh, the world's too small to not just be kind as much as you possibly can. Exactly. exactly. I obviously can't do it all the time, but at least at work. <laughs> yes i i'm always kinder at work than i am at home i know uh-huh. i know it's a lifelong problem but yeah but my friends thank you so much for joining us today and please remember life happens between knits and pearls and pearls <laughs> ta-ta for now Bye.